So, Mr. Joshua, you, you've done quite a bit of things up until this point. I mean, advocating, making sure our school system um, has adequate resources. You, now we're talking about uh, putting more diversity in the district attorney's office. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the desegregation case. As you know, uh, East Baton Rouge Parish had the longest desegregation case in U.S. history. Uh, and you were a part of that, you know, and I believe in 2003 is when it ended, 45 years. And what was your role within this desegregation case? What, what exactly were some of the results of, of some of the efforts you made? Yes, the school district in East Baton Rouge Parish had been operating under what they call a desegregation plan that was implemented and ordered by Judge Parker, federal judge. Uh, subsequent to my leaving the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board as a school board member, I was hired by the local NAACP uh, to represent the NAACP, which was a plaintiff against the school board. Mr. Robert uh, Williams represented the original plaintiffs in the uh, school, uh, in the lawsuit rather. Uh, that was an emphasis from the parish, both from black and whites, that they wanted to end the desegregation case. And when the impotence arrived for that to take place, we had been in the desegregation order for 44 years. We talked with a number of pastors, Charles T. Smith of Shallow Baptist Church, uh, felt like we had been in under the desegregation order for over 40 years, it was time to set a charter, a new course. And so we came together, uh, Mr. Williams, myself, and Mr. Charles Potan, who represented the state of Louisiana, uh, along with Franz Marshall of the United States Justice Department. Uh, we met in Washington, D.C., discussed the parameters on how to uh, reach a settlement to end the lawsuit. Uh, eventually that settlement was reached. I signed off on it. Uh, I think Robert, all the other uh, plaintiff attorneys signed off on, on, off on it as well. And we ended the desegregation suit, resulting in a termination of the litigation as well. well what were some of the what were some of the results of that desegregation case for, for those that were involved? Well, it ended a long journey. East Baton Rouge Parish, uh, unfortunately, the white school board members had fought the effort of inter integration between the schools, of uh, the races between in the schools. Uh, Judge Parker uh, was not pleased with that. But nonetheless, over time, uh, we made some tremendous strides to improve the schools and academically, but unfortunately, the whites began to pull off from the school district. And so our school district now is predominantly black, as it were early on before the suit was filed. We had public schools that were historically white. We had public schools that were historically black. And we sought to integrate those schools where we would have racially balanced schools. And so the effort was to bring that about through the uh, court order. Uh, there was some success with that, but that was um, some success took place, but others did not. And so because of the effort had been winding for a number of years, we thought it was necessary to end the lawsuit, end the litigation. And now the public school system is out from under the DCA order, and then they can assign teachers and assign students to the schools, what they call neighborhood schools now. But it was a tedious journey, and it was a very escalating time for both black and whites because the community was on edge. Uh, the, the white community didn't want desegregated schools, largely. That was some who did. Uh, the black community basically wanted better schools. They didn't necessarily want to integrate, but what they wanted was the same type of schools that the white students had and the same type of instructional uh, materials and resources that the white schools had. And you're saying some some great things, and and I want to ask this to you during that time when the desegregation case ended, and some of the results were not favorable for you guys. And as you stated, some of the uh, whites were able to pull out and 
and subsequently start their own uh, schools still isolated from some African Americans. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was your mindset uh, during that time? Did you feel that you did have some impact? Uh, how, how was how was your, your feeling at the time when you saw so many people still pull out? My mindset was to make sure that the historical black schools had the type of resources, had the type of instructional material and buildings and functions that the counterpart had. I wanted to make sure that our schools were second to none so that the black kids could get the same type or level of education that their counterparts. And when we created the magnet schools and the gifted and talented schools, uh, we believed that we had reached a level of success that we knew had to take place. Resources had to be put in those schools because they had been treated uh, badly, to say the least, over the number of years. They had not received the funding of the level that the other schools had received. Now, this didn't stop you right here. You you, you were in integral involved in, in the East Baptist Parish School, so, but then you transitioned, now you're trying to get into the, to, to the Metropolitan Council. You're trying to get into our city council. Tell me a little bit about uh, your, your advocacy work uh, in the East Baptist Parish uh, City Council, because you were, as we know, uh, East Baton Rouge Parish is, is a consolidated government. Baker, Zach, and Central, and Baton Rouge. And they make up where we have a mayor president position that is elected here in Baton Rouge. Yes. And you also was involved in making sure there were more minority representation. Yes. As well. Tell us a little bit about some of the things you were able to do and mm -hmm. people you were working with to try to make this happen. Yes. I do not know why God prepared me for the time in which I served. Uh, every time a situation arose where African Americans needed a leader, a voice, so to speak, to speak for the least of these or those who didn't have a voice, God had prepared me and brought me to the forefront. And so I had no choice but to avail myself and put myself again into the, the fight that was into the struggle, so to speak, that was taking place. And so I was again, Ernest Johnson, a local head of the NWCP at that time, later on state head of the NWCP for the state of Louisiana. He and I joined forces and we began to look at the form of government for uh, the uh, city and the parish of East Baton Rouge. We believed that it was a form of government that diluted the voting strength of African American or minorities. And because of that, we filed a lawsuit to change the form of government. Uh, that lawsuit that we filed eventually resulted in the adding of a new district. Current Councilwoman Donald Collins Lewis sits in that seat today. It was the fifth seat, adding an additional council person to the Metro Council. And so we have fought the battles that needed to be fought. We have some gains, but we have some scars also as a result of those battles. Wow. So. It's just like you're you're involved in a lot. You we went from the school district to the metropolitan council. Now we're going into the judgeships. Now we're going into you advocate because there's not enough minority judges, and and I see that you were integral in the Baton Rouge City Court judge. Yes, yes. And so tell us a little bit about that particular fight that you that you took on yet again. Yes. This time. Although we had district court judges as a result of the Clark uh, litigation that resulted in the change in the district court, the 19th Judicial District Court, in which the Clark Roman and the Clark Edwards lawsuit was filed, I was not involved in that one that resulted in district court judges. But I was the attorney that was involved in the suit against the city parish to change the Baton Rouge City Court construction of their judgeship. At that time, there were five seats and African American held two of those seats. We believe because of the change in demographics, because the number of African Americans voting in the parish and in the city had increased, the African Americans should have had an opportunity to elect another candidate of their choice. So law was, suit was filed against the city parish in the city of Louisiana to do just that. And as a result of that lawsuit, we also, uh, while the lawsuit was pending, we commenced to um, 
and go before the legislature and testify to the legislature and to move a, a bill through the legislative process. Uh, and while the lawsuit, federal lawsuit was pending, the bill was passed, uh, re removing one of the um, uh, seats that was in a white district into a citywide type of election. And as a result of that, Judge Tarver Smith was elected to that uh, city court seat, increasing the minority judges on the bench. And now we have three minority African Americans, rather, on this bad news city court. And wow. that was a fight well done. Wow, wow. And, and I'm just I'm just at all just listening to walking history because oftentimes uh, we remember folks after they're long and gone, and we think about all the things they've done. And we walk around people every day and not knowing what they're doing. Yeah. And you're a perfect example of so much stuff you've done that many have no idea. Many people who have the opportunity to go before these particular judges or before these particular people to have an equal opportunity or fair representation, you were behind some of these things. Yes. And, and that's just a powerful thing. Now, I, I want to switch gears again, right? And I, I want to take it back to the school system because I believe education is the foundation of everything. And I believe that in order to minimize the poverty in our communities, we must educate individuals at a higher rate, right? And so I want to talk a little bit about the GE testing, okay? You were integral in the GE test because that was an exam that students needed to pass to graduate. Yes. And tell me a little bit about that particular test and what involvement you had with that particular test. As a member of the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board, I would request the annual statistical data on the uh, African American graduates because I was keenly concerned and aware that the uh, rates among African Americans were lower than the rates of whites that were graduating out of the East Baton Rouge Parish School District. And because of that, we began to look at the test that was uh, put in place to determine whether or not a child graduated from high school. Uh, Mr. Ernie Johnson and I again came together and filed a lawsuit to challenge the graduate exit exam to say that it was biased against minorities because of the cultural differences between uh, the whites and the blacks and the type of questioning that was being asked. We felt that the type of questioning was geared culturally bias to the African American. So we filed this lawsuit in the state district court. Uh, Judge Bob Downing was on the bench, ruled in our favor at the state, at the trial level. We won the lawsuit. And we were on the appeal, eventually we lost on appeal. However, because of that effort and efforts behind the scenes, the uh, legislature eventually eliminated the graduate exit exam because of the biasness and the other factors uh, that was at play at the time. Oh, wow. From where it sits at now, and I'm looking at it fast forward to 2014, 15, is that you have to have about 23 credits to graduate high school. And you're saying that there was a test, even after you received the amount of credits you need to graduate, there was still a test that you must pass to graduate. And so forget about all the credits you had earned. If you don't pass this test, all those credits is, is fell by the wayside. Yes. That's and how that, the test was constructed. That is true. Now, it wasn't always that way. When I graduated from high school, all we had to do was get the minimum level of credits to graduate, and we did graduate. But change occurred. The legislature went in and said, not only are you going to take your required number of credits, but we're going to give you a exit exam to make sure that you meet these minimum standards. And that exam was culturally biased against African Americans. And so they weren't achieving the level of success, even though they had graduated from high school. And this is what's so disturbing to us because we had kids who had went through 12 years of school and finished the 12th grade, but did not meet the requirement of the exit exam. And they were not allowed to get their graduate diploma. Now, Mr. Johnson, this is the question I want to ask you. You have a, a lot of experience with speaking up for those who or voiceless, um, speaking up for those who need help. And my question now, you're, you're now a candidate for district court judge. I am. And your experience 
uh, as a civil rights activist and civil rights attorney, what experience do you have as an attorney um, that uniquely qualifies you to become the next district court judge? Thank you for asking uh, that question. I believe that a candidate for an office of judgeship has to have the judicial temperament. He has to be uniquely qualified to hold the office and he has to have a compassion for people. I believe that my 35 years of legal experience and training uh, has uniquely qualified me to serve in this unique capacity. I believe that uh, because of the battles and the cases that I have been involved in, both from a civil rights perspective, but also from a criminal perspective, I've litigated hundreds and thousands of major felony cases. In fact, I have one client that I'm not pleased with being on death row today. Very few attorneys have handled what they call death penalty type cases. And you're looking at one of them. Wow. And and that's that's what I like to hear is because you you're you 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 not only do you have experience as a community activist, but you have experience in the courtroom. Yes. And the temperament as you speak. Now, as a person who don't know much about politics, don't know much about all these other things that you fought, the question will remain is how fair will you be? Because you you fought for a lot of African Americans. As a district court judge, now you're fighting for, now you have to be a judge for all races. How do you feel about being fair to everyone besides those that are African Americans? Yes. How do you feel about just regular individuals yes. that are, are not a particular of color? I believe as a judge that we have to be as colorblind as necessary to render an impartial decision. We cannot allow a person's status, nor their wealth, or their race stand in the way to true justice. Justice must be served regardless of where you are. And oftentimes in the judicial system, those that are wealthy get better results. Those that are poor get lesser results. It's unfortunately. And as a judge, I am the final arbiter to make a just decision for all people, regardless of race, statue, or ethnic origin, or sexual orientation. That is my job, to be fair, to be impartial for the people of this parish. Mr. Johnson, that, that is eloquently put. Now, you're gonna be going to areas such as Central, that's predominantly white. And you're going to go into Zachary, where now it's almost 50-50 split. Baker, majority African-American, parts of Baton Rouge. So part of East Baton Rouge Parish Judicial of the 19th JDC is it's it's, it's divided into three subsections. Yes. You're going to be trying to buy for a position that has never been held by a minority. You're going to the northern part of East Baton Rouge Parish, where for the first time in history, there are more, more African-Americans than there are whites and others. So do you feel this is a time now to go in and run for a seat that has never been held by a black man or a black woman? What are your chances or what do you feel as though you can appeal to those that are in central that don't understand or can't relate to some of the things you've done for African American? What are you saying to those individuals who, who say, I want to judge and I don't want him to be biased with black folks or or because he's worked with a lot of black people that if a white person comes in front of me that he's going to show not the same favor or temperament. What do you say to those people who are concerned about that? Yes, I say that my treatment of African Americans and other races, white in particular, I've represented white clients. I have defended them just as vigorously as I represented African Americans. There were no distinctions because it's my duty, I was duty bound to represent the interests of people, regardless of race, regardless of color. I say to Central, if you want a judge that will be fair, that will be considerate, and that will be impartial, who has your judicial experience, then I am your candidate. Because I am aware of the school district in Central. I am aware of the problems in Central. I have gone to that area. I walked in those communities and I've listened to those voters. I know they share their concerns. What they're concerned about is the safety of their homes, the safety of their children, and the safety of their communities. They want a judge 
who would render justice fairly, swiftly, and certainly. And I promise to them, my commitment to all of the, uh, this community is to make sure that I will represent the interests of all of our people in the way that you will be proud of. Well, Mr. Johnson, I want to first thank you so much for coming and sharing with me and those in the community about what you want to do as judge, because judgeship is a very important position and there must be specific qualifications that mu one must have to sit on that bench. And I'm glad that you were able to share with us and I'm glad you were able to share with the community about your qualifications, some of the things you've done. Yes. You know, and I thank you so much for joining us. And if there's anything else you would like to, to yes, let people know, I want you to look there and, and let the people know. Point. Our community is hurting, whether you live in the northern part of the parish or the southern part of the parish. We are a community of one. And when one part of our community hurts, the other part hurts as well. We are living at a time in which violence in our communities uh, is there. We know it's there. Some turn ahead. We have to face it. And I am ready to uh, lead this effort to change the structure of the courts, to bring about domestic violence courts that are really instrumental in changing the conduct and behavior among family members. I'm committed also to bringing about veterans type courts. Our veterans come from foreign wars, come from combat duty, and they come back with mental health issues. We have to address those issues. Those are the persons we have served this nation and we have to help our veterans. So I want a veterans court that gears itself solely to our veterans to treat them like they deserve to be treated. And so I'm gonna be an advocate for changing the court's strict structure for veterans courts, domestic violence courts, and then courts that meet the needs of those who uh, want to turn their lives around. We have a whole lot of misdemeanor cases that can be resolved very swiftly, very quickly. There's no need to keep an individual incarcerated for six or eight months for a misdemeanor type of offense. Those type cases should be resolved within two to three months at best. And so we're gonna have a system in place that's rigorously uh, uh, weighted toward resolving cases as swiftly as possible uh, within the dynamics that we face every day. But let me assure all of the citizens of this parish, this is our time to do those things necessary to improve our community. We are a community of one, I believe in God, believe in all of the rights that all of us have as citizens of this parish and this state, and let us now go forward as one nation and one people, indivisible under God, without a reference to race or color, but a reference to humanity and a reference to the consciousness of an individual. Let, I'm asking you to judge me based upon the content of my character, not the color of my race. And I thank you for having me. And I thank Dan for interviewing me today. Thank, thank you. you. Sir. Yeah, I wanna thank y'all so much for tuning in again. There's going to have the times of when this is going to be uh, available for all you guys to see. Again, I'm Daniel Bangale. Thank y'all so much for tuning in, and we'll see y'all again soon.